Hi, Siobhan. I'm doing very well, thanks. Are you free to talk? Yes. Yes, absolutely. All right, phenomenal. Let's get started. Okay. You'll have to cope with my frequent chats, I'm afraid. Oh, uh, well, it's the, uh, I guess it's the price of international calling. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so um, I guess let's begin here. Uh, this is Alexander Pearson with the Celebrity Cafe interviewing uh, Siobhan Demer of Mono uh, in Violet, Indiana, and Swoon. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very how glad to doing? hear that. I'm doing well, too. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to uh, start out um, talking a little bit about your childhood. So I, you know, I tried to do as much research as I could, uh, but there's, there's only like four surviving interviews of you on the internet, and two of them are in Spanish. Uh, okay. So my... Wow. My impression of your childhood is that um, many of your family were in the entertainment industry. Is that true? Yes, that's absolutely true. There was probably three members of my family that were from that background. And since then, there's been probably, you know, loads of generations of us have become musicians or artists on some level. Mm -hmm. So my father was... Um, in a very famous band called The Shadows. He was the drummer, and they had a lot of number one hits, one of them being Apache, another one being Diamond, and they're, they're sort of like quite iconic, uh, a very iconic 60s band, I think, um, that even the Beatles were very influenced by. So um, that was my dad's band, he was called Tony Meehan. And then my um, grandfather was the... Uh, gong banger on the rank trailer movie that, that sort of uh, guy that's all oil that sang the gong before the movie begins that was my grandfather and then my grandmother was a dancer and she used to dance with Shirley Bassey she used to be one of her backing dancers so there was loads of us we all kind of gravitated towards that world for some reason I guess it suited our temperament well, you know, my experience is that uh, musical talent does tend to run in families. Uh, and it's it's quite clear that, uh, you know, whatever sort of musical talent was running in your family went directly to you, Siobhan. <laughs> wow. I, I think for me, it was, it was a bit of a case of not really being that good at anything else. It was <laughs> like... But yeah, I think I can, I, I can actually do this quite well. I'm not great at science or biology or definitely not math. Um, my English grammar is not too bad in literacy, but music was one of those things where I was like, yeah, this feels really comfortable. I think I'll do this, and people seem to like what I'm doing, so I'll, I'll go down this road. Yeah, people have responded very well to your singing style. You know, whether uh, back when you were doing, I, I think they were at the time calling Mono a retro futurism album, but, you know, now it's more known as uh, trip hop. Uh, but, you know, then you went on to yeah. do Shoegazer and lots of other stuff. Uh, you, you have an, an I, I would consider it a very sultry uh, sort of singing voice. And uh, it, it really... Uh, it really expands the range of the uh, the songs that you're in. Yeah, I think the reason that I kind of um, developed that technique and style was because it seemed to lend itself to the kind of music I was doing with Martin at the time. So before that, I was a bit of a frustrated soul diva. And it wasn't really working for me because I couldn't compete with Shaka Khan, people like that. So I was like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. So what I came in down, tone it down, and then I met Martin Virgo from Mono, and he played me that Life in Mono backing track, and he said, how do you fancy singing over this? And so I just tried a different technique, and then he said, that's it! Yeah! And that was it, and that's how it all started. So, mm. And then I kind of like started writing the album with him, and it all just became very dreamy and ambient, atmospheric, and it just, it was you know, as the cliche says, that it just evolved and became sort of very organic and natural. 
So I'm glad that happened because it helped to then springboard me into all the other projects, including Violet Indiana with Robin Guthrie, which was another one of those um, kind of quite dreamy, although it's a bit more dynamic, I think, than Mono. Well, you know, there's there's several years of of growth as an artist in between those albums, so I, I don't think we should be surprised at all that uh, you know the uh, the sound in Violet Indiana is more complex because you as an artist had grown by then. Yes, I think I had grown also with my confidence, and also because uh, with Robin, when we when we started recording, he literally just said, "Listen, I don't write lyrics." The last girl I worked with didn't really she didn't didn't really have lyrics. She just used to do melodies and harmonies. And he said, "So if you're gonna do lyrics, here's the pen." So he gave me a pen, and I started writing and singing. And then I was like, "Great!" So I get to do all the lyrics. Whereas with Mono, it was a totally different dynamic. We had to share everything. Whereas all of a sudden, the earnest was on me. And he said, "Yeah, I'm gonna do the music. You're gonna do the melody and the lyrics." And we're going to do loads of beautiful albums together. And that was it. And it was great. So it gave me that confidence to kind of expand a bit more and maybe include some other aspects of my singing dynamic. Well, that's that's very interesting. I, I tracked down a uh, video interview you did here in Los Angeles in, I think, 2003 uh, with Robin Guthrie. And uh, you, you said that you like especially for Violet Indiana, that uh, for songwriting, you you had basically no influences, that you were you were writing about and singing about your life, almost like a diary. Oh, yeah, I'm still doing that. <laughs> so that's, so that's now your preferred that method of songwriting? Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, yeah. I said, so that's not your preferred method of songwriting, or was that always uh, the, the direction you yeah. leaned in? Well, it, it seems with me, I, I kind of um, I can't do it any other way, which is why I don't sing other people's songs. So if someone sends me ideas and lyrics, I get involved unless I'm writing the lyrics. Not that I'm a control freak, but because I have to feel it to sing it. So normally, I just um, write about my life, which is very revealing and does leave me slightly vulnerable. Yeah, well, it might leave but you hey. vulnerable, but I think that's what people respond to is, um, you know, you, you, you have such a, a dynamic voice, but uh, you, you put yourself out there with the things that you sing about, and I think that resonates. Well, that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that people will they'll connect with what's going on. Because obviously we're, we're just human beings at the end of the day and we are just a series of emotions and reactions. So that, I'm hoping that they will connect with that and feel that through the way I deliver the vocal. That's the plan. Um, okay. Is, is it true that you uh, took a break from Violet Indiana to have a child? I did. I did take a break to have a child. I think I toured um, with, whilst I was pregnant, with my my oldest son. I've had another baby since that. Mm -hmm. and Congratulations. Then I kind of, thank you very much. And then I kind of, um, yeah, Robin moved to France and it became a bit more complicated to record. So we did, I think we did do one more album, I think, at the time. But it was quite difficult, to, as in long distance romance, long distance recording is quite difficult. So I think we kind of left it there. And then I was a bit confused life and music and wondering who I was as a person and going through all that stuff and then thinking, what do I do next? And then bam, along came um, Gary Bruce, who was uh, part of Spoon, the Spoon lot. And, and, and that's how that happened we, we formed a band together and and I was able to, to do a new album which is coming out in America actually when, so, uh, when is it coming out um, from all the information that I could find I, I could only you know identify in 2015 that a new album was coming out soon yes and then we kind of didn't it, lots of things happened for one reason or another and we kind of uh, 
um, kept taking a break from recording and then getting back together. And there were so many things going on in both our lives that we didn't really get to finish the album as quickly as, as we had wanted. And then, um, yeah, so it's, it's now we've taken our time and we've had um, some help with production and stuff. We, we just literally were trying some ideas out. And then uh, St. Marie Records contacted me and said, we would like to release anything you've been involved in from the past. Um, we love your vocals. We love what you're about. What do you have? And I said, well, to be honest with you, you won't be able to re-release any mono. Violet Indiana will be tied up. But I've got this new band. Would you like to listen to it? So he listened to it. Uh, Wyatt did it at St. Marie Records. And then he said, this is amazing. I'd love to be part of this. Please um, sign with us. So that's what we did, and then we were off to a publishing deal in London. So it, it all kind of happened. Um, I know it's going to be released. We're just waiting for a release date in the new year, so it'll probably be around March um, in the new year. So hopefully they'll like that one as much. It's quite an emotional album, um, and I'm hoping that people will be able to connect with it as much as they have with my previous material. That's interesting. Um, you you said that uh, this is a a more emotional album, uh, but you know, from my impression of you, it, it's it sounds like you already put an awful lot of emotion into your your your, your previous yeah. albums. I mean, you invested a lot of yourself into it. So, what was it about this album in particular that really stands out to you as you know truly emotional to you? Okay, well, I think in my personal life, I was probably at breaking point, and I got to the point where I'd had romantically, I'd given up. I was in a terrible headspace. I mean, I'm not in that place now, but mm -hmm. when I started writing the album, I was in a very, uh, I don't know, in a, in a very strange headspace and kind of like giving up on life and love and all these wonderful things, I, you know, all these dreams and aspirations, everything had... It was like a, a sort of a very sad time for me. And the only way that I could really express those emotions was through my music. So I was keeping it, I was keep, keeping a very brave face. And then I was sneaking off to the studio and releasing these emotions via music. And it was like my little world where I felt safe. That I could go and sing about all these things going on in my, in my life. And it, it, I don't know, it, it just felt uh, very cathartic. Okay. Well, so you you are I hope doing a little better now. Did uh, did creating the album help to uh, alleviate some of the uh, I guess some of the emotions that were raging out of control, or has it just been a matter of of time and you know time healing all wounds? Yeah, I th I think that it's just it was just. Uh, reflective of, of my personal life back then, which thankfully is not in that place anymore. I mean, if I wrote an album now, it would probably be quite different. But I think at that time, yes, that, that, that's what it was. It was just, um, it, it was quite healing, to, and it was it was nice to kind of get all those emotions out, and I listen back to it now, and some of the lyrics are quite powerful, quite edgy, you know, quite... Uh, I don't know, I think maybe I was a bit daring on some of the lyrics, but it was honest. And that's, that's, that's the bottom line, I think, with an artist, the honesty transfers through and, and people connect with that honesty. So it was an honest piece of art that reflected that time of my life. And hopefully I'll do the same as I move on and progress in life, as you do on your journey. That's a that's a great segue to my next question. Uh, so once this album is released, uh, what do you have on on plan? What what do you plan for the future? Are you going to be releasing more under Swoon, or are you looking for other uh, songwriting partners? Uh, what's next for Siobhan? Um, you know what? I, yeah, I would. Um, I'd love. There's a show in London called Jules Holland. I don't know if it if it comes out in America, but I would love to to be on Jules Holland. I'd love to do a Bond film. Um, there's many things on that bucket list. I think I, before I die in this life, I would love to do all these 
different things, pick these boxes. Doing, you know, I did a few film scores back in the day. I did one, um, you know, the Great Expectations. Obviously, then uh, I've been used. My music's been used extensively in incidental music. There was one with Numi Graf in, in a film she did, um, mm -hmm. and then advert campaign. I've done lots of things through media, but I'd like to get that one big song that you go, wow, that's it. And so I'm going to do another album with Swoon because I think we're a great partnership. And then I'll be open to other offers that come in after that, you know, other writing teams or featuring on tracks. I'm always open to that, but they just have to be right. I don't jump to anything, but if something tugs at my heartstrings and I feel that it, it would work with what I'm doing, then I'm always open to offers, yeah. I read in a 1996, or maybe it was a 1997, I don't know anymore, uh, interview with you that you originally picked the name Mono uh, from an album of Phil Spector's Back to Mono, which was on the wall in the studio where you were uh, recording. Is that true? Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember. I don't. I don't know if that's true. Okay. I don't know if that's. I think there was a, there was a selection of names, and we were kind of like just going through the list. But I couldn't. I wouldn't like to say that was a fact, but it's a possibility. Okay. If I get sued. Hey, no worries. Look, it's been twenty years. <laughs> exactly. I can't, you know what? I can't stop because there was so there was so many going on at that time we weren't even a band when we met we were two people that were literally trying out some ideas and then our manager went right you guys are going to be a band and these this and what are we going to be called and it was like, it was all kind of up in the air and then it was like a big thing with the publishers who's going to write the song what the percentage is going to be do we even want to be a band it was like an arranged marriage and i'm not sure if it was a good idea but it, it worked for a while Hmm. It's an arranged marriage. That's such an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, I can absolutely see. You know, I mean, it's like, fine, I guess, you know, we get along in theory, but, you know, it's yeah. when you take away that organic part of a relationship, it can sort of, you know, leave you. Exactly. Yeah. And right. then when you go on tour and when you really get to know a person and you see different sides of their personality, it doesn't always necessarily work, although it should on paper. Technically, we probably should have done another album. We did try, but it ended up not going well because we were having creative conflicts and all the same issues were coming back. So it was one of those things like when you break up with someone and then you try and get back together and then all the problems that were there before start surface again and then you think that's why we're not together anymore yeah I've, so that's kind of what happens. <laughs> yeah, I've certainly lived that before <laughs> um i wanted <laughs> i wanted to ask you about uh the singing lessons that you took as a child with uh sola Kopsini. did i say that right sorry could you say that again um when i while while you know reading some of your uh your biographical info, I, I learned that uh, when you were a child, you took singing lessons from Greek actress Sula Kopsini, and I wanted to ask I you did. your experience. Oh, my God. What did you want to ask me about her? Sorry. Oh, well, no, I just wanted to ask you with your experience. Uh, my, my impression was that it, it was mostly to sort of build up your singing stamina. Oh, she was. She's still a really dear friend of mine. She was basically Sula Kopsini. She was she was a Greek movie star in the in the early seventies. Very beautiful kind of blonde Bridget Bardot type that featured in these kind of art movies back in the day. And um, she was fantastic because she was one of these very direct, you know, speaking kind of professional women that was. She was having, and she she helped me with stamina, breathing me. Um, she was emotionally very, very supportive when because I was really so shy when I started, and my grandfather, who was a 
Swedish psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. When I got to about 15, he said, he said, okay, Siobhan, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't really know what I'm very good at. I quite like to be an actress. And he said, okay, what else? And I said, I'd like to play the trumpet. So he said, okay, I'll buy you a trumpet. So he got me a trumpet. And then he said, okay, I'm going to pay for you to go and have some singing lessons with this wonderful Greek actress, movie star. She's apparently doing singing lessons around the corner. So I went to see her, and she was straight to the point. She was like, she was literally, if you if you want to be a singer, you're going to have to develop your confidence, your self-esteem. You're going to have to perform in front of me. You're going to have to come back next week with a song. And I was like, I can't do a whole song, but I know a bit of a song. And she was like, well, that's nonsense. You need to go and learn a song and come back next week. Otherwise, don't bother. I don't want to waste your grandfather's money. And I was, I was really quite shocked. I thought, she's quite rude. But actually, she was right. So I went home and I learned a song and I came back and she was like, no, it's not very good. Come back next week. No, no. And then she put me on the piano. She helped with my breathing technique and she helped to develop my self-esteem and my confidence, which was very important because I didn't ever know how I perform in front of a crowd. That was a really big thing for me. And she just totally um, helped to embrace that whole side of me. And so I'm very thankful to her. And she still comes over and has a go at me and has a cup of tea, and we still end up laughing and hmm. hugging and crying all at the same time with lots of cake. That's incredible. I, I'm glad to hear that uh, you're you're still close. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and, she, she honestly, I would say she was very responsible for my career. Well, yeah, it sounds like uh, Grandpa Demer and uh, Sula Kapsini are the uh, are the real powers behind the Siobhan brand. Absolutely, they were they were so inspirational, and you know, there's certain magical people in your life that just they they have that little thing about them that they they they've got wings, I'm sure, and they carry you when you you think you can't even stand up. They lift you up and help you to fly again and they were definitely those those two very important people at that time that you know have followed through into my journey in this music business which as you know is a very strange one you never know what's going to happen next yeah one day you're living in paris the next you're uh in a famous band with a uh with a song in a famous movie there you go so you, you just, uh, it's very, very unpredictable, the music world. One minute everyone's taking your call and you're flying high and you're getting going around in great big taxis, it's all fantastic, and the next minute you can't get arrested. So it just kind of goes to the territory. But the great thing about it is that it's so unpredictable, so you kind of, um, you, don't, you don't really give up because you keep on thinking, wow, well, maybe... Maybe I will go and do that song again, and maybe I will get back in the studio. And for me, luckily, I've, I've had um, I've had a lot of support through social media where people have said, we really want to hear you sing again. We really want to hear another album. What are you doing now? We can't wait. We want to buy it. And so it just inspires me and encourages me, and, you know, it just makes me want to do more. That's – it's so true. I was I was on a, a, a YouTube video of – I, I think life in mono actually, and I was looking at the comments, and they were almost universally uh, positive. They're like, you know, where has Siobhan been? You know, why hasn't Siobhan, you know, done a? It was so funny you mentioned that you wanted to do a, a, a you know, a Bond movie theme because it seems like your fans are unanimous that like, why haven't they had Siobhan Demare do? James Bond, because whoever they got to do the last one, whoever they got to do the last one, sucked. Exactly. Like, hello, come on. I, that's what, I, honestly, I would be, that would, that would just be it for me. That would be the icing on the cake. So I said to my new publishers, come on, you've got to sort this out. And she said, yeah, we'd love to. You know, everybody wants that same gig. And it's like, well, come on. I'm, I'm one of those people, so make it happen. It would be amazing if that call came through. So, you know, fingers crossed that, that, you know, something like that would happen and that would just relaunch my career back into the limelight again. And I could come over to America, do some more shows. You know, I'd love it, absolutely, you know, and to play live again 
all over the world, which would be amazing. Well, I, I know we'd love to have you because as far as I can tell, um, while, while your fan base may have, you know, gotten a little over the years, they are, they are still there and they are still very responsive to the sound of your voice. So sweet and, and so lovely. And I get messages every day that are just like that, so encouraging. So I'm here, I'm ready. I'm, you know, the new Spoon album has been, people will connect with that and it will just springboard me into great things again. And I'm so thankful for the support of America because they were so behind that first little mono album. I mean, we even had Madonna at this, at one of our gigs at the El Rey Theatre in Los Angeles. I remember my manager saying, Madonna's here. And I was like, Madonna? Oh my goodness. I mean, what an honor. Like the queen of pop is in the audience of my gig. Yeah, and apparently that's... we were her favorite band at the time. I mean, it's like it was just insane. I think we we couldn't even process what was happening at the time. So I do feel really honored to have that level of respect from some of the greatest artists. All right. Well, I think that is a perfect place for us to wrap up. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the interview. I and your time. I really appreciate it too. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I can't wait to read it. All right. Have a wonderful evening, Siobhan. And thank you for uh, answering my phone call after 8 p.m. No, no. Thank you so much. You have a lovely rest of the day. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.